Welcome to the Tech on Tap podcast with Justin Parisi, Brooklyn Glenn Sizemore, and Sully the Monster. I love NetApp. Oh, yeah. Hello and welcome to the Tech on Tap podcast, Blender edition. That's right. We're mixing this all up because it's insight and almost, uh, and we're very busy. So um, without further ado, uh, hi, Glenn Sizemore. Hello, Justin Parisi. How are you, my friend? I am feeling like I'm in a blender. Um, so uh, we, we've had several shows we've recorded already and they're ready yeah. to go, but we can't yeah. talk about them yet because it, it almost secret. feels like a challenge to see how many episodes we can record in a single week. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's good because we have episodes and we won't run out of content, but it's bad because I really want everyone to hear what cool stuff is there. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit for the listeners. Um, we planned on publishing every single one of these episodes and the people involved every single time decided on second thought, we would like to wait a little bit longer before you can talk about that. So you and I are sitting on just this gold mine of of actually super interesting technology and conversations that I can't wait for us to hit release on. That's right. And you know, that's not to diminish what we're going to talk about today because we also have some super interesting content and conversations that we had uh, as pre-insight interviews uh, that we did with a couple people. Um, so we started off with David Mancusi and uh, we finished up with Justine Ma just now. Yeah, so earlier this week, we were talking with David Mancusi about GDPR, which is, uh, do you remember what that stands for, Glenn? <laughs> General Data Protection Regulation. Yes. So yeah, GDPR compliance. Uh, this is mainly important for the EU, but as we learned from David, this is also very important for a global uh, perspective because we do business with the EU here in America and other places. So uh, let's take a listen to that now. We are sitting here with David Mancusi. Uh, did I say that right, David? Here's our Mancusi. Yes, you did. All right, Mancusi, like a like a koozie you keep your beer in. Um, so David here is going to talk to us about GDPR. So David, what do you do here at NetApp? Well, I'm a global architect. I work in the strategic consulting team, and mostly what my focus is on helping um, NetApp's largest customers in figuring out their more intractable problems. Uh, so a lot of that is, you know, talking with uh, the business of IT owners, understanding what are the big business challenges that they're trying to solve, and figuring out what are the right technology approaches that would help them to achieve those goals. The EU General Data Protection Regulation, it's a uh, new body of regulations, basically a rewrite of all of um, Europe's um, general data uh, approach uh, dealing with EU citizenry uh, private data. And the rewrite is meant to consolidate a bunch of things and update, you know, some of the rights that they're uh, ensuring for EU citizens. Um, it is not just a regulation that's going to impact the people in the EU, though. Uh, it's going to affect any business anywhere in the world that either stores or processes EU citizens' data. So it's a very, very large um, regulation, and it's got some teeth to it as well. Um, the starting point with this is that they will charge 2 million euros per incident for a violation of their regulation. Now, a lot of companies in the United States also deal with regulatory agencies. This is a rather stringent set of rules, uh, and the real uh, difficult part of this is that if you're a a global, multinational, uh, multi-billion dollar company, uh, they could also take a bite out of you, uh, up to 4% of your gross revenue for, vi for each incident that you violate GDPR. Sounds like a lot of incentive not to violate it. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's going to be complicated, too. Uh, GDPR is made up of 99 articles. It's got uh, what they call 173 recitals, recitals being... Uh, clauses in each one of those articles, and they define specific parts of what this regulation includes. Uh, but, you know, the good news for people in IT is that the vast majority of this is regulatory law, which is going to affect the business more than it is the IT department. Uh, the IT department is really going to have to deal with maybe 15 to 16 percent of all of those regulations and the implications that they've got in it. Okay, so um, do you have any background into, you know, some of the backstory into why this all happened? Like, why did the European Union decide to get so stringent 
on the data protection piece? Well, um, actually, there have been a lot of um, uh, incidents over the last five years where information from large companies has been breached, you know, by um, different types of cyber crimes that have been perpetrated. Um, a recent example of that would be Equifax here in the United States, where 143 million uh, people's personal information records have been accessed uh, and you know potentially taken away. A lot of people are going to feel the effect of that. Uh, more locally to the European Union, you know, National Institute of Health with their ransomware issue with uh, the WannaCry piece, right? So, I mean, this applies across the board, across the globe. But the European Union is making a strong case into how to approach uh, making sure businesses take care of their data. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there, there are a lot of things that they're granting as, as rights as the individual as well, which I think is um, it, it's probably a good thing. Uh, but there are some interesting clauses to this thing. For instance, um, you know, one of the articles speaks specifically to limiting the amount of data that a business can collect from you. Um, you know as well as I what it's like to fill out a credit card application. And, you know, sometimes you're scratching your head at some of the information that they're requesting. But, you know, questions like what is your sex, uh, what is your religion, stuff like that will be out of bounds if you're applying GDPR uh, for EU citizenry. So the law stipulates basically that you're going to have to only ask for the information you need in order to complete a process. So that means that you've got to go, you know, from an IT perspective and think through a data classification model, which is driven by a business um, glossary, a business glossary being definition of what is the information that we need in order to do uh, the business process. Now, having said that, there's other things that are going to be equally interesting about this. Um, one of them, probably the most widely understood impact of GDPR, is the right to be forgotten. And basically what this means is that a data subject, now this is the person that owns their own private information, can request of any business, I don't want you to have my data, please erase it right now. And you'll have a very short pe period of time with which to remove, erase all of that data from all of the systems that you've got it in. That includes online databases, archives, and backups. Now, most companies in the United States are not geared to be able to deal with that. But then there's also some complications as well. Here in the U.S., a lot of um, financial regulations require businesses to hold on to uh, business transactions for up to seven years, like credit card transactions, for instance. Now, a credit card transaction has got some personal information in it. So the resolution is also in GDPR. They said if there are local laws, that tr uh, local laws will be allowed to trump GDPR. Now, what would happen in that particular circumstance is that uh, the data subject reaches out to you and says, erase all my data. And you say, well, I can't erase this class of data because my local laws tell me I have to hold on to it for seven years. That data subject can come back and say, all right, well, okay, if you can't get rid of it, I don't want you to process anymore. Well, what does that mean? Well, basically what that's going to mean from an IT perspective is that you're going to have to have a flag that's associated with that data record, which has those data types. And there's a list of data types, name, address, phone number, um, social security number, or tax ID, you know, a list of things that are personally identifiable. You're going to have to have that flag so that in your processing, if it sees that flag, it does not do anything with that individual record. And it gets better. Uh, there's another thing. I don't know if you've ever received um, annoying phone calls from people soliciting you on your cell phone or your home phone number. And in the United States, we have a national do not Re uh, disturb registry. But even so, um, these businesses that have these auto dialers will call you uh, with their information. It's direct marketing. And one of the rights that is spelled out for an EU citizen in GDPR is the right to object, which basically gives them the right not to be contacted with any direct marketing. And so you would also probably need to add a flag to that same data schema that would limit the processing of direct marketing activities for this. 
And one other implication here, which is pretty important, is that let's say that you are uh, a like a small hotel and you have people from the EU come and stay at your hotel and you've got a need for their credit card information. They pay for the transaction with a credit card, but you're not actually processing the credit card transaction. You have a, another company that does that for you. So you send all these transactions over to your bank or uh, to the credit card processing company. It is your responsibility by GDPR regulation that you ensure that your third-party agency is also complying with all of these rules as I just outlined it. So if the data subject asks you to erase, you have to immediately convey that to all the third parties that also have access to that information. And one last thing that I wanted to add about this is also when you are uh, gathering this data, you have to inform the data subject where is it that your data is going to be stored how long is it going to be in any of your systems? And specifically, how are you processing it? It's not going to be a simple law to comply to. However, again, this is all about regulatory compliance. So IT is there to really kind of help to achieve compliance, not necessarily to be compliant, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so how is NetApp helping us you know, accomplish these goals for the GDPR, right? How is NetApp going to enhance the ability for customers and in, in enterprises to be able to comply with all these regulations? Well, you know, NetApp has actually got a very unique position in the industry, and that is that NetApp has already um, applied for and achieved a binding corporate resolution, regulation. Um, a BCR is not a simple thing. It requires a rework of how it is that you're uh, managing your data governance uh, approach, your strategy towards IT, uh, and the integration of all those uh, business processes and leverage of IT. Uh, we've achieved that, I'd say we're about 98% done with getting that process done. And what this provides in terms of value, it means that we can share data with companies around the world that have also achieved these BCRs. Um, and, you know, NetApp is one of about 100 companies here in the United States that actually complies with this process. So we've, we've gotten through the most onerous parts of this already. Uh, so I think with that experience, we can certainly help uh, a customer that is trying to figure out what it is that they're trying to do. Uh, and we've got a number of things that we're putting together that will help or to define specifically where it is that a customer has gaps and, you know, and being able to comply with this regulation as well as some things to help to evaluate, you know, how they would approach this from an operations, an IT operations perspective in order to ensure that they are fully supporting GDPR. Uh, now, that said, that's a little bit about services, but, you know, NetApp also has a lot of good technologies that can help. One of the things that NetApp has a very good uh, handle on is how to encrypt and protect data. Uh, we've got a number of products that fully support encryption, and that is one of the things that's spelled out in GDPR, is that the data on wherever it is that's being stored has to be stored in a way that it is encrypted, and they also do something else called pseudonymization. Now, what pseudonymization is, is that it replaces fields that are being used to overlay and be able to connect records together with you know, kind of dummy data, if you would. And this, this way, it protects that record from being able to be overlapped. An example of which would be if you had a record that had a credit card number in it and you had a, a database with all of the credit card transactions from a particular company, you know, I'm a cyber criminal here, uh, I've gotten this database. If I had that credit card number, I could then correlate all of the information that I have for that particular record with that credit card number, and I'd probably find who the name of the person is, I'd probably find their address, I'd probably find a lot of other interesting information that would allow me to do um, less, than, um, less than nice things with it. So, David, uh, is this affecting only European countries, or does it affect everyone in the world? You know, this is, uh, this is going to affect any company in the world that processes or stores EU citizenry data. Um, Another example that I'm going to be giving at Insight in the pavilion is that of a, you know, I started talking about the hotel. 
Uh, but, you know, in a, let's say that your little hotel, a mom and pop hotel, like a bed and breakfast that's in Colorado, and you're right near one of the best slopes in Vail, and you get people from all over the world, and you get to charge high prices, but people give you credit card information, and you may also have a loyalty program. And that loyalty program in and of itself would collect a lot of personal information. The information that's collected from a credit card perspective might run into some com conflicts with U.S. law, but that royalty program would have to fully comply with what it is that uh, is described in the GDPR. So in, in the United States, there's going to be a lot of impact, and it's not just going to be to financial companies. All right, David, sounds great. Sounds like NetApp is really making its uh, mark on how to uh, deal with the regulations that are coming up with GDPR. Um so, David, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you for questions about GDPR and NetApp's role with it, how would they do that? Well, there's two ways, actually. The first of which is my email is always available, and that's david.mancusi, that's spelled M-A-N-C-U-S-I, at netapp.com. The other way is that you can reach out to your account team, and you can ask them for some support around GDPR. Uh, and I'm a global resource, so I can go anywhere in the world to help out with, uh, with trying to solve these problems. But we do also have many other resources that can help you locally that may be a little bit more familiar with your specific circumstances. Um, that would be a good way to get started. And again, you know, DENEP has got a ton of different technologies and solutions that would help in solving this from, uh, for the portion of IT impact. Uh, solving those issues that we've got. So All right. This is fun. Cool. Well, let's do it again sometime. I'd love to. All right. So we learned a little bit more about GDPR. Uh, we learned about how NetApp is enabling people to comply with GDPR regulations. Uh, so I guess that's redundant, isn't it? GDPR regulation. It's kind of like the, the Nick card. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But, but I also thought that Dave had a pretty valid point there about, you know, that Talking about risk in, in, in the modern IT con context is not something that, that I think happens enough. It's interesting because the most valuable conversation I had at VMworld was with uh, a handful of, of administrators. And it was basically just me sitting down and walking them through, here's how you break to your boss that you don't have a disaster recovery strategy and that their entire business is at risk right now. Because like, over the course of our conversation, these two individuals and myself realized that that was exactly the boat that they were in. Like they were one cooling pipe bursting from losing the entire business, right? And and didn't even know how to start that conversation. So when you take a look at something as scary as GDPR, something as unknown as, as what that means, particularly to these worldwide companies that, that have to, to, you know, bend at a whim when, when the regulations change, the fact that NetApp IT is set up to just come in and walk them through what that means and then to help apply our technology strategically to make that easier, I think that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've actually talked about GDPR on the podcast before. Um, I don't remember what episode that was, but uh, you can also learn a little bit more about GDPR from uh, one of the AT members, uh, Tech Stringy, uh, or Paul Stringfellow. He has a podcast called Tech Interviews, if you want to take a listen to that. He has an interesting EMEA perspective to these sort of problems as well. So uh, we actually finished up the interview podcast here with Justine Ma of the PS team. She's a product manager over in the PS org. And we talked about the new NetApp Solution Connect uh, product that we have that it ties into the Snap Center 3.0 NAS file services uh, portion of the product. So uh, without further ado, Justine Ma, take it away. Uh, hi, Justine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Good. So, Justine, if you could tell the listeners what you do here at NetApp. Sure. been here around almost three years now. I am a product manager for professional services, uh, mostly focused on cloud and our data, perfe uh, data protection portfolio. Okay, excellent. So um, I guess you – so as a product manager for PS – what sort of things do you get into? <laughs> that is a really open question. So I work with my team. Um, we're comprised of product managers, um, services engineers, and architects, and we figure out um, customer solutions. So 
we're consultative. We are focused on solving our customers' problems. So for this particular one, we were focused on data fa- our data fabric products and making sure that our customers get the most out of them as quickly as possible. So anything from understanding the scope of a service, the customer use cases, um, working on the go-to-market strategy and how we're going to you know go out and you know market this and sell it, and also you know internally um, ironing out like all the, de- the small details that you have to take into consideration when you're working on a service. Okay. So uh, I guess the reason why we brought you in is because I guess there's a new NetApp Solution Connect Services. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that is at a high level? Yeah, definitely. So we've been working on this one for a couple of months now. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, it's about um, the data fabric. And the name says it all. It's connecting your NetApp products and solutions into your data fabric. So pretty, So there are different multiple of products within our portfolio that are designed to be connected together. Um, sometimes a customer can perform it um, themselves easily. It's simple. Other times when we're dealing with a complex customer environment, it's not as simple. It's not as easy as one, two, three. So we, as our NetApp experts, we know that our technology is the best. We know we're always trying to figure out how to make our customers' lives easier. So, you know, we define three different um sets of capabilities around ONTAP Cloud, SolidFire, and AltaVault, and then working, um, you know, putting out training, delivery collateral to make sure that this goes as easy as possible. And then I can definitely jump into more details around each of those um, capabilities if you like. But essentially, we're trying to make, um, you know, make the data fabric come to life. The point of the data fabric is data mobility. So this is going to make it much easier for customers to accomplish that, um, especially for complex environments, too. So yeah, let's go ahead and break that down into the smaller parts. So let's go into more detail for each of those. Okay. So um, the first one is ONTAP Cloud Connect. Um, basically, we're connecting your ONTAP Cloud um, instances back to your on-premise uh, FAS or AFS systems. The whole point of ONTAP Cloud was to be an extension of um, our ONTAP operating system, but but in Azure and with Amazon, um, our hyperscalers. So it is done through Snap Mirror relationships. Um, we make it, you know, we've defined a very good, um, a very tight scope on how we can achieve that really quickly. So. Um, that is our first one that uh, we thought that would be very valuable for our customers. The second one is AltaVault Connect, and there's two different use cases for AltaVault. Um, a lot that we've seen so far that our customers are very um, comfortable with is AltaVault um, with Alt, uh, um, Storage Grid. Sorry, with AltaVault, so connecting those two um, solutions together. And then the second use case would be for Storage Grid. Um, uh, back end to SolidFire S3. So that's fairly new, um, but with SolidFire as our, the newest addition to our family, we thought it was um, a no-brainer. It makes the most sense, and we also have been hearing a lot from our customers around this particular use case as well. And then the third one is the AltaVault Connect, and here we're connecting AltaVault with your on-prem FAS um, or AFS system, and then it could be managed with Snap Center, or we can manage it with ONTAP CLI. This might sound really familiar. That's essentially um, that's our data fabric solution for cloud backup. So um, in preparation for Insight, if you kind of think back to the last two Insights, there was a really big demo on stage, and we talked about you know being able to pull um, you know one file from your on-prem system and then back it about back it into the cloud. So that's that solution uh, you know, brought to life. And then with services, you know, we're happy to help customers who need to have that um, configuration done for them. Um, it can get a little bit tricky for certain customers, but uh, others could be, you know, it could be a walk in the park. But regardless of that, it's available. We're here to help with that use case, um, that specific data protection use case as well. So is that tied into Cloud Sync or is that tied into the Snap Center file cataloging functionality? Yeah, that one is tied to Snap Center. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the cataloging. Or you can use on top CLI. Different the two scenarios um, support different um, use cases and limitations. So but we've we've gone ahead and you know made sure that we can support both of those. Okay, and what's version of Snap Snap Center is that available? Is that three or is that coming out in mm-hmm. a later release? Yeah, that's 3.0, um, and it's with the uh, the NAS file license plugin. Okay, excellent. Yeah, we actually covered that in a podcast uh, earlier this year. Uh, we had John Spinks on to talk about that Snap Center 3.0. Oh, yep, same yep. team. I guess I would just add that um, 
we've been hearing more from, so as we kind of go out and we talk more about the service and the value of it, we've been hearing a lot more requests from um, our sales teams, from our customers about different, different ones that they want help with. So there's more to come. We're looking at the rest of the portfolio um, and make, and then kind of figuring out which ones we want to tackle next. So stay tuned, more to come. And we're hoping that, you know, with this podcast, we're getting the word out there that this is available. PS is here to help. You know, we're here to make sure that our customers achieve their outcomes quicker. So contact us if you have any, any questions at all regarding this solution. So you, you mentioned Insight a few times. Uh, where would mm-hmm. we find you at Insight? I will be at the professional services booth. Um, so we have two booths. So you can find me at either one. They're side by side. PS and also business consulting. And it's going to be right in the middle of like the NetApp pavilion next to the product showcases too. I'm but, sure it'll be relatively easy to find. Much more important question. Um, what free stuff are you handing out? Uh, come find me and you'll see. Oh, it's a surprise. It's a surprise. Uh, I picked out I like one surprises. of them and I'm pretty proud. So That's I good. hope people like it. That's good. <laughs> so this all sounds fine and dandy, Justine, but why would I want to use any of this? That is a really good question. You want to use this because it really gives you a solution. Like we're we're trying to make everybody's lives easier. We're trying to make sure that the whole implementation goes really smoothly. So instead of just, you know, selling or having a customer figure out how to connect a different products together, we're, we, we're going to leave them at the end of the day after the engagement is performed with a uh, with a solution that really tries to, um, you know, accomplish, achieve like whatever business problem they're they're solving for. And based off of what we're currently offering, it's mostly centered around hybrid cloud and data protection. So our consultants are all very well versed in storage, networking. They're going to make sure that all the knobs are turned, that they're going to walk away and the customer is going to feel that, you know, they have this end-to-end solution that they are, that, that they've invested in from, from NetApp. All right, Justine, sounds like this is going to be something to look out for in the future as well as the present, I guess, because we already have it. Uh, so if you want to check out Justine, check at Insight, go to the PS booth, of course. I'm sure she has plenty of cool free things to hand out. Justine, thanks for joining us today. Thank you both so much. This was fun. All right. That was Justine Ma. Uh, you can find her at Insight Central uh, in the PS booth, of course. You know, she, she said it in the interview, but but you know, this is us taking those demos that, that we've been showing on the, the main stage at Insight for the past couple of years. And the, the core technology that we've been developing on the back end that makes those demos possible, now we're at the point of assembling all of this together for core customers or for, for, for actual end customers. But it's still at a point where, you know, some assembly is required. So professional services is jumping in there and, and, and putting these easy buttons on these processes so that, you know, situations like with with uh, NetApp Solution Connect, you can just come in and hit go and, and our teams can can parachute in and just make that problem go away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're just trying to further simplify the overall process. Every, you know, from everything from the GUI that we use to manage on tap to the overall out, you know, external off box pieces where you're trying to tie the solution together. You have a little bit of familiarity with that, right, Glenn, with the whole converged infrastructure piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's just a little. So, software is eating the world, my friend. <laughs> nom 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 nom. All right, that music tells me it's time to go. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email to podcast at netup.com or send us a tweet at netup. As always, if you'd like to subscribe, find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or via techontappodcast.com. If you'd like the show today, leave us a review. On behalf of the entire Tech on Tap podcast team, I'd like to thank David Mancusi and Justine Ma for joining us today or this week or whatever. Thanks for listening. So, uh... You're going to be hanging out here, man in the fort, oh, or at Insight there, Glenn? Yeah, man. I just hit 280 light. I plan on doing lots of rating while you guys are uh, while you're, you're educating the partner base. I expect no. uh, several um, uh, validated designs by the time Is I get back. Is it just me that's getting off on this? Hey, I chipped one this morning, oh, my yeah. friend. NBA 1116. Whoa. FlexPod Data Center with Microsoft Applications. Exchange 2016 and SharePoint 2016. Nice. Uh, 300. That's new. It is. Well done. Well done, sir.